Ah, the joys of traveling the river on a steamboat. People have enjoyed the fresh air and adventure of an excursion boat from the time of Robert Fulton until the 1920s. But steamboat traffic has not always been safe. Several calamities have had an important impact on the town of Pekin, including a boiler explosion on the Prairie State at the wharf, claiming 110 lives. Forty years later, William and Emma Caput were on board a boat called the Frankie Folsom, heading back home to Pekin. They made a promise that day in 1892. A terrible storm uh, came through, and the boat was capsized, and several people uh, came there. I'm not sure how many were killed. I think about a dozen uh, were, were, were killed on the, on the Frankie Folsom. William uh, and Emma Caput survived. And uh, uh, after that incident, they vowed that they would never go on a steamboat ever again. And they kept that promise until 1918, when neighbors said, steamboats are different now. They're bigger, they're, they're, there's more safety, they're, they're safer now is what they told them. And they did convince the Caputs to go with them on that excursion that night in 1918. Riverboats of all forms plied the waterways as former Europeans helped to push the boundaries of America further west in the early 1800s. The development of steam-powered boats helped to fuel this expansion. As towns sprang up along the river, so did the need for more goods and materials. Packet boats sprung up to deliver a wide array of merchandise to these growing towns. Everything was carried on the steamboat. Um, freight, animals, they even brought some of the first railroad trains that would eventually put the steamboats out of business. And then the excursion boats came after those boats went out of, out of business. They, they stopped carrying freight on the steamboats and they were carrying on railroad. And so they had to figure out how to use a steamboat and they turned them into excursion boats. The renovated excursion boats were designed for play instead of work. One of the more popular vessels on the Illinois River was the Columbia. Like many excursion boats, it began its career as a work boat under a different name. The Douglas Boardman was a boat that was used on the Mississippi River to carry and push logs down to some of the lumber baron yards uh, along the Iowa side of, of the river. Uh, the Douglas Boardman became the Columbia. And this is how it worked back then. Usually when the hull of the ship was worn out just because of use, they would replace the hull, put a brand new hull there, and take the upper works of the boat and just put that on a new hull, usually give it a new name. The Columbia was typical of steamboats at the time. It was uh, maybe one of the larger boats in the Peoria area, but it also had that birthday cake tier design where the um, main floor, the bottom floor, uh, was the largest, and then a little bit smaller was the second floor, the dance floor deck, and then the top floor was kind of a viewing area, and then they had a smaller, uh, they call it a, a captain's quarters, and then on top of the captain's quarters was the highest point of the ship, which was the pilot house. One of the more popular destinations for excursion boats was Al Fresco Amusement Park, about five miles north of Peoria on the Illinois River. It was a great, uh, great name for it because it was open air right here looking over the Illinois River. And it had all the, all the usual features of an amusement park with the roller coaster and the Ferris wheel and all the rides and everything that comes with an amusement park. But they've also had palm readers, they had uh, fortune tellers, they had dancing, and a big part out here was music. There was entertainment virtually every weekend night, and even sometimes during the week. And some of Peoria's biggest bands and orchestras played here. We also enter had entertainment from all over the country. They had Tom Mix, they had John Sullivan the Boxer, they also had Harry Houdini. They wanted it to be a clean, family fun area. And with beaches, they had 500 lockers for folks to put their clothes in 
and get out there and swim and lay on the beach and everything. The water's made for a very nice beach because the Illinois River flows gently from Henry, Illinois to its confluence with the Mississippi. It is generally a straight river, but it does have a couple of curves. Now, one of those curves is known as Wesley Bend because of a small fishing village known as Wesley City, today called Crivecourt. But that bend has two 90-degree turns. A century ago, the Columbia, Alfresco Park, and Wesley Bend found themselves at the confluence of the worst tragedy on the Illinois River. A hundred years later, we still search for the cause of the sinking of the Columbia. Nearly 500 people were anticipating an evening full of entertainment on July 5th, 1918. The Columbia was picking up passengers at two locations before heading north on the Illinois River. After they picked up a load of coal, about 40 passengers boarded in Kingston Mines. Then they came back up to Pekin, and that's where about 450 or so people, mostly from the Southside Social Club, boarded the ship. And it was called a Midnight or Moonlight Excursion. And they were going to leave from uh, Court Street, the, the foot of Court Street in Pekin, where they pick up most of the passengers. And they would steam up river to the Alfresco Amusement Park. And then they come back and they promised everyone they'd be back by midnight. The people had a great time. I mean, you know, they were excited to go to Al Fresco Park. It was a, you know, it was a major attraction on, on the Illinois River, with, you know, at Peoria. It was about an hour and a half ride down here to Al Fresco Park. It was promoted to come down here at the park, but I found in research that they only stayed about half an hour. And after a half hour, the only, th there was no passenger list. There was no, you know, they weren't checking names off as they came back to the ship. But the only way that people knew how to get back on was they would ring the bell or they would blow the whistle. As the passengers scurried to get back on board for the return trip, one man hesitated. When George Heim and his wife had boarded in Pekin, he had what you might call a prescient vision. He was a sailor and his instinct told him something was wrong with the Columbia. And he even went to one of the crewmen and asked him, I think there's a problem here. Can I talk to the captain? And they kind of you know, pushed him aside. They didn't really answer any, any, any of his questions. So he thought, you know, that's it for me. He got off at the Alfresco amusement park and decided, I'm not getting back on. The captain was Herman Mel, and he was not worried. He felt he had the safest boat on the Illinois River. After all, the federal government had told him as much with two inspections earlier that same year. The federal inspectors from the Department of Commerce Steamboat Division came up from St. Louis and came up here to Peoria and went through the boat and they found some problems. And what they found was some uh, crack seals were, were getting larger in the hull, which isn't unusual for an older boat and this was an older boat. So they told the captain, before we can approve you for this next excursion season, you need to make these changes. You need to fix this. So the captain ended up sending the boat down river uh, and not only fixing those seals, but also reinforcing the hull with steel. The inspectors came back and they went through the boat again, another thorough inspection, and they were so impressed by what the, the captain, Mr. Mail, had done, that they called the boat the safest boat on Western waters. And the captain was so happy about that, that on the side of his boat that year, he painted the words, safety first. The federal safety designation filled the captain with confidence, so much so that he made a risky financial decision. Yeah, he didn't have insurance that year because he called the Illinois River that muddy creek. And the reason why it is because the, the, the river itself isn't very deep. It's maybe about 20 feet, maybe a little bit more at, at, its, at its deepest point. In the height of the Columbia, up to the top of the pilot house, about 45, 50 feet. So you figure if the boat just slowly sinks into the water, at least the top deck of the boat is still gonna be above water. The captain made one other change to his boat that year, a change that would prove ill-fated. He extended the interior of the second deck. Not only did it uh, expand the dance floor, maybe that's what he wanted. 
<laughs> is to get more people in the dance floor. But what, what it also did is it removed two of the exits, at least to the outside, which were on the sides of the ship. So now the only way to get down to the other levels was to go to the stairways on both ends, both the bow and the stern had a stairway. With these recent repairs and renovations completed earlier in the year and a confident captain, the Columbia was ready for a summer of excursions. It was Friday, July 5th, and the boat was heading south from Alfresco Park. It had been an uneventful trip as the boat passed Peoria and headed to Wesley City. And they were on a part of the river where the captain and the pilot had been many, many times. So they didn't expect any kind of problem. It was nearing midnight, and Tom Williams, the boat pilot with 25 years of experience, saw a fog was setting in. He turned on the searchlight to help cut through the gathering mist. Not only was he going through a treacherous part of the river, the bend, but also in that bend was a very uh, large sandbar. And all the pilots knew that, it was on the navigational map, but you had to go one way or the other to get around it. So you had to do some steering to get around the sandbar, and you're also going around this curve. Remember, when the Columbia stopped at Kingston Mines, it took on a fresh load of coal. That coal was stored in the front of the boat. The coal probably caused the boat to, to kind of shift and the captain couldn't, or the pilot couldn't turn it with that heavy coal in, in the, uh, you know, stored in the, in the boat. So he was drifting over, and I, I don't know whether he chose to go to the Peoria County side or not, but he was drifting over to the Peoria County so side and couldn't stop it. So the boat drifted until it actually scraped the shoreline. And no one in the boat had any idea what was going on. They couldn't see outside the walls, but when a branch broke through a window, that's when one person who was on the dance floor said everyone just stopped in their shoes. The captain, when he heard that window break, the first thing that he thought was possibly because of where they were at and because of what he knew was on the Peoria County shoreline, that possibly a, a branch or a, a, a submerged stump had stoved a hole in the hull. He thought that first. So he called for a first mate. And the first mate came and the captain told him, orders, go down to the engine room and check for water in the hull. And so the first mate came in and said, the captain wants you to check for water. And the engineer says, I already did. I do it every time. We checked it when we left El Fresco. And they did. Every time the boat would move, they would always check the hull. Now, the, the, checking the hull was a matter of a, a trap door on the first deck where they would just open it up and look down. So he grabbed the flashlight. And they went to the door, he opened up the door and he shined the flashlight and they say he, he rose up quickly and was white as a ghost. And then the first mate actually jumped in to the hall and when he got out, his trousers were soaked over the top of his knee. So there was trouble. He ran back up to the captain, told the captain, showed him the water on his trousers and said, there's water in the hall, sir, how much? And then gave him an indication that there was about two, maybe three feet. So the captain shouted up to the pilot, run her ashore, Tom, run her ashore, is what he said. Well, of course, they were already along the shoreline. But I think what the captain had in mind and what the pilot ultimately decided was that they had time enough to move the boat over to the other side of the river. Now, why would they do that? The Columbia ran aground on the Peoria County shore. It was a rough shore with trees and shrubs and underbrush. Whereas on the opposite shore was Tazewell County. It was not only a shallower approach, but there were people living there in Wesley City, coal miners and fishermen. A decision had been made. And so the pilot sent the word down to the engine room full speed ahead. He backed up the boat off the shoreline and off they went full steam ahead towards the Tazewell County side of the river. In the meantime, the captain knew that if the boat did sink and it would start to sink slowly, he had to get everybody up to the top deck. So he started shouting, get to the top, get to the top, he shouted. And at first everyone was confused like, well, well what do we need to go to the top for? Until the captain said, the boat is sinking. 
He had to almost give a description of what was happening before people responded. And maybe that wasn't the best call because then at that point, panic, chaos, and everyone on the dance floor, those who possibly could have left the exits and walked along the deck rail on the outside to the stairwell were suddenly making their way to only two exits on either side of the ship. And the people who were on the dance floor deck who survived remember hearing the sound of timbers cracking, of boards, beams breaking before the boat just fell apart. They all got trapped in the boat when, when it broke in half, the, the hull broke in half, and then the concession stand and, and other things came sliding down the dance floor where most of these people were. They were dancing, having a good time, and then they were trapped inside the wreckage. They say most of the people who were killed were killed by a violent, they called it a violent death back then. You were struck by something heavy, and either you were, you were knocked unconscious, killed instantly, knocked unconscious, or uh, you drown because you were unconscious. But most of the people who were killed were killed by the falling debris that had crashed on top of them. The Columbia had two lifeboats and numerous life preservers, but they were of little use in the chaos and confusion of the passengers as the boat went down quickly. As the Columbia lay crumpled in the middle of the river, a rescue effort began, made difficult by the darkness of the late hour. The earliest rescuers were passengers, including brothers Joe and Bill Kumpf. Joe put his swimming skills to work. He was one of the first to start helping people by dragging people over to the shoreline. Then he'd go back, swim back out into the river and grab someone else. But one time he went back and someone had panicked and grabbed him and the weight of the other person apparently pulled him down and he perished as well. On his grave site uh, is written the hero of the Columbia, Joe Kumpf. To the north of the accident, Chester Stringer was working that night at the Peoria and Pekin Union Rail Yard when a call came in, ordering a train to help deliver survivors from the wreck site to Pekin. Stringer quickly volunteered. His wife and son were on the Columbia. And so when he heard that the Columbia had went down, uh, he volunteered, even though he was supposed to get off on his shift, he volunteered to take one of the special trains. They started sending special trains, and that's where he saw uh, and realized and was waving frantically at his wife and, and child as, as they both recognized each other. As the body count mounted, County Coroner Lawrence Clary, who was also a doctor, was called a little after one in the morning. Upon arrival, he realized the rescue effort was winding down but he decided to wait until morning before any further recovery efforts would continue. But there were several bodies, about a dozen, that had been pulled initially out of the wreckage that night, and the coroner had made a decision that those bodies would be taken by tugboat down the river to uh, Court Street, and then carried by volunteers from Court Street up to, or from the river up to a makeshift morgue on Court Street. In all, 87 people perished in the wreck. Many of them were trapped beneath the submerged rubble. Rescuers sought local diver Earl Barnwalt to help find and recover the bodies. He had the equipment, and so he was the first one to start doing the diving and trying to recover some of the bodies. Eventually, they called on a experienced diver from Chicago. His name was Harry Halverson. That, in turn, required volunteers to transport the bodies to shore. Help came from Jake Graff, a Pekin City Constable, an officer of the peace. Jake's primary uh, job was to remove the bodies off of the boat. Uh, he did have a small rowboat, and uh, there wasn't a lot of them on the river at that time. But uh, Jake having a car and uh, a boat, and he could haul it, uh, Grandma remembers him putting it on top of the uh, old Model T and uh, going to Wesley City. The dead were of all ages. One of the youngest was Mabel Harbold from Kingston Mines. 
She was just 18 months old. The stories are tragic. Amy Witchert was found by her would-be rescuers embracing her two sons. One last embrace. One was seven. The other was barely a year old. Her husband survived. He was someplace else when the boat went down. There was a girl who had just graduated from high school. She went on the trip with a friend and they almost missed the boat when it left Alfresco Park. They didn't hear the whistle or the bell go at first until they finally did, and then they ran. They said they ran like the wind to try to get on the boat, and they, they, the one girl said that they had just arrived as the gangplank was starting to go up, and they were able to bring it down, and they both were able to get on the boat. One of those girls was one of the victims that night. Questions remained after the accident. Among them, did the expansion of the dance floor walls contribute to the boat's collapse? This is not clear, but it may have hampered the exit of passengers. There was a clear answer to the question about whether the hog chain snapped, which would have accounted for the boat buckling in two. The hog chain, it's a heavy steel cable that goes from the front of the boat up across the top like a bridge and down to the back. And what it does, it holds the, the stern and the bow up like this. The captain had told them the hog chains did not snap, he said. He, I know this for a fact. And when they finally did look at the wreckage and saw the poles that held the hog chains together, it was the poles that snapped. A federal inspector supported the claim. The hog chains had been pulled out intact. But another question that remains unanswered to this day, what punched a hole in the hull? Was it a submerged tree stump? a log or the sandbar. A series of legal proceedings did not provide a definitive resolution. The be best explanation is that it was an older boat, that uh, it was very stressed that night due to several factors, and that whatever started to break first just caused that chain reaction of the whole first uh, deck to come down, crashing down on the dance floor deck. In 1919, Tazewell County filed charges against the captain, Herman Mell, the pilot, Tom Williams, and the captain's brother, August Mell, who was the steamship's purser. There was some question on whether he was letting people uh, or stopping people from going up one of the stairwells. Uh, and they were all charged with negligence uh, and manslaughter. And the question is really not whether or not they were out to kill anybody that night, but whether or not they had made the right decisions. Those criminal charges were eventually dismissed, but the federal government initiated its own legal proceedings against the captain and the pilot. But when the steamboat division uh, came from the Department of Commerce, the two federal inspectors, the same two inspectors who had called the boat the safest boat on Western waters, came back after the wreck to interview the captain and pilot to decide whether they had made the right decisions as crewmen. And that was an easy one, that they were definitely guilty of not making quick and efficient, and, at this, and, and in this case, possibly deadly uh, decisions. So both the captain and the pilot lost their, lost their licenses. Tom Williams, the pilot, suffered from an undisclosed ailment in the aftermath of the sinking. A year after losing his pilot's license, he was admitted to the Jacksonville State Hospital a mental institution. He never left. He died there nearly eight years later. Captain Mel, on the other hand, he fared much better. The captain, and it was a businessman, so he ended up just going about what he did, which was selling, at that point, selling some cigars and got into the real estate business and, uh, and lived to be an old man. William and Emma Caput survived the sinking of the Frankie Folsom in 1892, and they kept their promise to never board another steamboat for 26 years. Tragically, they broke that promise to themselves. They were two of 57 Pekinites who died that night in the sinking of the Columbia. Lucille Adcock was more fortunate 
When she made that boat trip with her brother, she was 18 years old. They hung on, they said, to a pole and were able to stay afloat until they were rescued by uh, men in boats. So they were able to get out of the water quickly. Um, she grew up to tell her story. She uh, became Lucille Bruder uh, when she got married. And uh, she told the newspaper stories during the anniversaries as the years passed. Uh, and in 2006, when they were rededicating the historical marker here at Riverfront Park, and they were having a ceremony, they were naming off the victims, uh, ringing the bell. Uh, Lucille was supposed to be a guest of honor that day, but she wasn't feeling well. So her daughters spoke on her behalf. At the end of the ceremony, they threw flowers into the river, and then Lucille's daughters went to the nursing home to check on their mom, and when they got there, they were told that their mother had just passed away in her sleep. The steamboat era basically ended here in Peoria. There were two dozen steamboats lined up doing charter excursions at one time, and they were almost always filled every weekend. After the Columbia wreck, that changed. People were scared to get on the boat. 